I'm here. I'm taking it. Just a moment. Good evening. This is Dr. Shamsul Huda from Auto TV. We are live now. I'll request Dr. Ashok Shyam to start. Yes, so good evening, everybody, and we are live now. I'll show you a disclaimer slide to begin with, where we, we thank all our faculty uh, for sharing their knowledge in this challenging time. We wish all our audience a healthy and safe day ahead. These webinars are dependent on internet speed, and uh, we apologize for any internet issue in the, in the if it happens in the course of the webinar. So over to you, Dr. Manisha. Uh, good evening, everyone. I welcome you all to this Advanced Deformity Correction webinar. And this is a combined effort of Asami and POSI. I would first thank Dr. Ashok Sham of Ortho TV, Dr. Shamshul Huda, and Dr. Ravi Johan for technical support. And without their help, this would have not been possible. Now, today for today webinar, we have two moderators, myself and Dr. Dhiren Ganjawala. I am Dr. Manish Dhawan. I am Senior Consultant and Professor of Orthopedics at Sir Gangara Hospital. I am also President of Asami India. And uh, I am a Limb Reconstruction and Deformity Correction Surgeon. Now, Dr. Dhiren Ganjawala is President of Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India. And he has done his orthopedic fellowship from Boston. And he has his own Ganjawala Hospital. Now, first of all, I welcome Professor Dror Pele from Pele Orthopedic and Spine Institute, West Palm Beach, Florida. He requires no introduction as every orthopedic surgeon in India knows about him. He is the author of Principles of Deformity Correction, which is a Bible for many surgeons practicing deformity correction. Professor Dror Pele had initial medical education in Canada and he did his fellowship from, with Professor Eli Zorau and also from Lico Italy. He's a true friend of India and he has traveled India 16 times and he was with us in Asamicon 2020 in Feb this year. So now I, uh, I request Dr. Dhiren Ganjawala to please introduce the uh, POSI panelists. Dr. Dhiren Ganjawala. Yeah, thank you Manish for uh, carrying out a wonderful joint activity with uh, POSI and the Asami. The first of all, like I would like to um, introduce to you, actually the person does not need any introduction. That's Professor Ashok Jori, the past president of POSI, the past president of uh, Indian Orthopedic Association and the current editor of Journal of Pediatric Orthopedic B. So I welcome Dr. Ashok uh, to you. this uh, meeting. Then Thank we you. have Dr. P. N. Gupta. He's, he was a vice president of Pediatric Orthopedic Society a very eminent deformity correction uh, expert uh, working in Chandigarh. Then we have another uh, faculty, the panelist, uh, Dr. Cherry Kuvur. Uh, he's from Kochi, and again, a person who has a great interest in deformity correction. Yes, Manish, you can introduce the Asami panelist. Yeah, uh, uh, our dear Dr. Mangal Parihar, he had his uh, medical education in Mumbai and he is already professor of uh, University of Mumbai. And he had done his fellowship under Professor Dror Pele. And uh, at present, uh, he is a senior member of Asami and uh, he has his own hospital, Center of Limb Lengthening and Reconstruction in Mumbai. Our second panelist is Dr. Bilin Chaudhary. He had done his fellowship under Professor Dror Pele and, and Professor Elizabeth, both. He is, a, he is also past president of Asami India, and he is also an honored professor of Elizrov Institute, Burgan. He is director of Limb Lengthening and Deformity Center at Akola. Dr. Ruta Kulkarni, she is associate professor at PGI of Swasti Rog Pratishtha in Miraj. She is vice president of Asami India. She is a limb reconstruction and pediatric orthopedic surgeon. So these are three panelists from Asami. And over to now to Professor Draw Pele. Uh, Professor Pele, Dr. Dror. Yes, I'm here. Yes, yes. Well, so thank you very much. You know, this uh, first time I've traveled to India right now without any jet lag or any, uh, um, you know, it's, it's the easiest trip I've made so far of my last 16 trips. Um, 
So it's uh, really uh, actually amazing how we are talking uh, across the globe uh, today on Mother's Day. Is it Mother's Day in India? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. okay. So uh, I see Ruta there. So happy Mother's Day, Ruta. Thank you. Um, and, um, you know, it's, uh, I think this is uh, uh, the sign of the times and also a sign of the future that uh, the future of meetings may become virtual, um, which maybe is a good thing. You know, it's uh, cheaper, it's quicker, it's easier, it's less disruptive. And, uh, um, you know, and, and now with the speeds that we can communicate, I mean, I don't even notice any delay. Uh, and yet we're speaking, uh, you know, from half a world away. It's really incredible uh, that we can do this. So, um, Anyway, so this will always be memorable. Now, um, I'm going to speak to you today. I was asked to speak about uh, congenital femoral deficiency and the, the use of the super hip and super knee procedures. Um, so I'm going to switch to that by sharing uh, my screen. There we go. Can you go? Can you all see that? Yes, sir. We can see that. Very good. So um, these are. Uh, this is a sign at the entrance of our institute, and uh, these are just. You know, every year, especially just around this time of year in May, a lot of children, uh, because of the upcoming summer holidays, begin their limb lengthening and reconstructive journey, and so. This is just a, one group of them from a few years ago, all with either CFD or fibular hemimilia or tibial hemimilia, you know, all about to start uh, lengthening around the same time. So, um, so we're going to talk about the super hip procedure, and um, but we need to back up and uh, talk about the classification of CFD. So uh, I think most of you are familiar with this. It's a four part classification and type one, which is divided into A and B has, uh, is an intact femur with, uh, um, so you have an ossific nucleus of a femoral head. You have a, a femoral neck, which may or may not be ossified. You have greater trochanter, you have the shaft, you have a, um, and you have a knee joint, you have a distal epiphysis and so on. Um, and usually, usually the patella is present. Uh, type two, you have a true disconnect, pseudarthrosis, and uh, type three, you have a diaphyseal deficiency, and type four really is a different disease. It's a distal deficiency, more affecting the medial femoral condyle, and uh, very rare, probably the rarest of all these types. I won't be speaking about that. I'm going to speak today particularly about the very deformed type 1A and 1B, which are the most reconstructable types. So we'll talk about the super hip procedure. Now you can subclassify uh, amongst these types. And you know, in the type one, um, you can have uh, uh, 1A, you have a normal, basically a hypoplastic femur. And uh, these patients maybe have a little valgus of the knee. Type 1B, you have a retroversion. Um, and maybe a dysplastic acetabulum. And then the type 1A3 is the one that really has the coxa vera, all the, the deformities that require the super hip procedure. And uh, so for the 1A3s, we do use the super hip procedure. Uh, type 1Bs, these are the delayed ossification of the upper femur. Why do we refer to them as delayed? Because actually, uh, if you look uh, at the natural history, eventually these cartilaginous areas will ossify. And you can have a cartilaginous area in the subtrochanteric region or in the femoral neck or a combination of the two. And the, that, um, that delay in ossification um, you know, makes it also um, uh, subject to many things, including breakage of these areas. 
uh, including dislocation of the hip, uh, this, uh, you know, and, and other major problems, and it limits hip motion. You know, and we'll talk more about this. So the super hip procedure that we're going to talk about is used for the 1A3 and for all the type 1Bs. Uh, the type 2s, we're not going to talk about. Maybe if there's time, we will. But um, they, the type 2s, you really have a, a, the pseudarthrosis, and you can have a mobile femoral head, or you can have a femoral head fused to the acetabulum. Uh, in both of them, you have a fibrous onlog connecting the greater trochanter to the uh, femoral head. And then, but uh, all a feature of the type twos, they all have a greater trochanteric apophysis. So if you really have a true apophysis, not just a cartilaginous remnant, then these are the, um, these are the type twos. Um, and the type two C has no femoral head at all, no acetabulum. And then you know, you know, your type threes also have various degrees of deficiency and everything is progressive from less deficiency to more. And so typical type three, you know, may have a femoral head, it may be ossified or non ossified, I'm sorry, maybe fused or not fused. Um, it's independent of that, but most of the upper femur is gone. There is no greater trochanteric apophysis. There's usually a flexion deformity of the knee. In the type two B, there's uh, such dysplasia of the knee, you don't have much motion. Uh, so you'll have less than 45 degrees of motion. While with type 2A, you still have good motion, even if you have some flexion deformity. And there can be a type 2C where there's either no femur or the femoral remnant is fused uh, or ankylosed to the uh, tibia. And you, you just would have an epiphysis here, ankylosed or fused to the epiphysis. And so that would be a type two, a three C. Type four, as I mentioned, is a different animal. It's a, you know, it's a deficiency of the medial femur and the lateral proximal tibial epiphyses. The hip is okay. And that has a whole different treatment uh, uh, compared to all the rest. So in all of these, we're focused, you know, the original name, proximal femoral focal deficiency. And you can see why that is. This is a progression of, um, more and more deficiency of the proximal femur all the way to here. But this is not a number four is not a deficiency of the proximal femur. So it doesn't really fit. I, I just felt uh, sorry for it. I had to put it somewhere and I've seen a few of these. It is a congenitally deficient femur. And so it got thrown in as number four. Okay, so we, we are going to talk especially about the type 1B. Um, remember, anything I say about the type 1Bs, you could apply to the 1A3, except that you don't have to achieve ossification of the neck uh, or the subtrochanteric region, but the deformity is almost the same. So you can see, you know, in the, I started my career um, in 1987. Um, well, in 86, I went to uh, I went to train with Ilizarov and with a group in Lecco and, and also visit various other people in Europe. And um, I started doing my own cases in 87. And that's when I began to be exposed to some of these type of cases. And uh, in fact, the one that you see on the bottom, the x-rays on the bottom on the left and right, this was a child that I, was, I saw in 1997. 1997 is the year that I, the light bulb went on and I finally understood what this deformity was. And um, I really did not understand that before then. So if you consider that I started in 87 and then I didn't really understand the deformity till 97, 10 years, first 10 years of my career, I made a lot of mistakes. I tried to, do, to bypass this. I, I did actually what Ilizarov did, which is just leave the proximal femoral deformity in place and then do an osteotomy to realign the femur. <coughs> and um, that um, led to recurrent deformity. So I really, you know, didn't understand why is this deformity coming back? What am I missing here? 
And I think what we were missing is the fact that we looked at something like this and we said, that's Coxavera. And we looked at something like you said, do you guys see my pointer? Um, yes. So um, we looked at something like the top left and said, that's Coxavera. And then the second thing we said is that's the greater trochanter, you know, and or right here must be the greater trochanter. And then this entire part is the neck. And that's what we thought. Now these upper, um, the 3D CTs you see up here, um, we didn't have the um, benefit of seeing those until these were actually taken in the 2000s. So I never saw this shape until sometime in the 2000s. So we unraveled this entire thing without seeing an MRI or a CT of all of this. And, um, but, you know, finally I'd figured out what is going on here. So let's proceed. So here's a great example. And I'm going to use this example. Um, it's a case I saw maybe around 2004. <clears throat> and um, it is a boy from uh, Northern Italy. And you can see he's about 13. So th 3D CT of this is possible. And you can see everything. And, you know, the, the lack of ossification here is, is um, isolated to the um, subtrochanteric region, this region here. Although at the, in the old days, we thought that was the greater trochanter. So you could even imagine the greater trochanter being split here. But that's not what the pathology was. Now, by the time I saw this boy, I fully understand, understood this problem. But I'm going to use his CT <clears throat> to show you what the real pathoanatomy is. And you can see even from the x-ray, you got a nice femoral head, a very dysplastic acetabulum. You can see, by the way, this is getting pulled out. It's going to dislocate with time. Um, that's a natural history of it. Uh, you can see there's the physis here. And then you see some of the neck. And then you see a, a very sclerotic line here. And then we're going to discuss that sclerotic line is the greater trochanter. The whole neck is only this portion, this very short part here. All of this is the subtrochanteric region of the femur the proximal subtrochanteric. And this already is the end of the subtrochanteric region where it meets the diaphysis, okay? So in fact, we were wrong initially. This was not coxavera. This was not the greater trochanter. So let's look at the 3D. So now as you look at the 3D, and I'll move it around, you can appreciate that, well, I mean, so that's what we saw in the X-ray. Femoral head, femoral neck. There's something here. Maybe you see something there. You're going to see that's the greater trochanter. And this is the subtroch region. And this is the delayed ossification. So as we start going around, you'll start seeing that is the lesser trochanter right there. Now, let's look there. There's the first view that shows you the upper femur. And look at this, uh, really incredible. A normal growth plate that goes from the greater trochanter to the femoral head all the way across, just like you would expect, just the normal growth plate. And there's the greater trochanter. Um, and of course, this is a CT, so this is the ossified part. Of course, the greater troch will go further. And there is the femoral head. I want you to notice something. There's the sacrum. Look at the direction of the greater trochanter. It points to the sacrum. Well, there is one muscle that runs from the sacrum to the greater trochanter, and that's the piriformis. So imagine if your, if your hip has always been in this position, imagine how short that piriformis tendon would be. It's really contracted. And in fact, if you try to move this out of here, you won't be able to because you're tethered by the piriformis. The other muscles that you can see would be tethered. So this, if the greater trochanter, as I showed you, is there, it's 
facing posterior. So when I show you an AP of the pelvis, you can see that the proximal femur is flexed. So it's flexed 90 degrees. So you can imagine the iliopsoas, which goes to the lesser troch here, is very contracted. You can imagine that the rectus femoris, which comes from the inferior spine here, is crossing this deformity like a bowstring, is very contracted. You can imagine that the tensor fascia lata, which starts at the inferior spine, I'm sorry, superior spine, okay, and wraps around this, is very contracted, okay? And the other muscle that's really affected by this will understand when we look now. So there's, oh, there's looking from the back. Well, you know that the hip abductors come from the iliac crest here to there. Well, normally, I mean, if you look at the other hip, they'd be going out to the side, okay? And so the hip abductors are very short. Why? Because you can see the hip abductors are going to run from there to there, while here they're only running over to here. And they never get away from the pelvis. Look at the short, the long distance of the abductor lever arm here, and look at the short distance of the abductor lever arm here. So the hip abductors are also very contracted. And because the top of the trochanter, you can see it should be at this level, but it's way up here it's they're really short so that's our fourth muscle is the hip abductors are really tight so we've got tightness of the hip flexors hip external rotators the hip abductors and and the rectus femoris and this is all part of it so part of the the light bulb that went off in 1997 when i kept seeing recurrence was the part that i wasn't seeing it was the invisible part and the invisible part was the soft tissues. So the soft tissue contracture, once I understood the bony deformity, I could then imagine and draw for myself where are these soft tissues. And that's when I realized what I was facing was the soft tissue contracture. We'll come back to that. So I created a model of type 1B CFD. And this is this model. So start with a completely normal upper femur in a child. And you can see the normal side with a growth plate here and blue is uh, cartilaginous. So you have the normal cartilage and there's the, the growth plate right there of the upper femur going across the top of the neck to the greater trochanter, which is non-ossified. On the affected side, we have a non-ossified entire proximal femur except for the ossific nucleus. But the neck and the shaft are 130 degrees to each other. The greater trochanter is at the center of the femoral head where it should be, the normal level. So that is our model. Our model is basically a normal hip, okay, but only looking at the upper, upper portion of it. Uh, in addition, if you want to look at the acetabulum, we have a retroverted acetabulum. Okay, so our posterior lip is 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 very small. Uh, we are we have a crossover sign and and so on. So we're going to come back to to that later. Right now, let's just focus on the proximal femur. So on the proximal femur, we can flex the upper femur. Um, so that the hip is uh, 90 degrees flex. And in this 90 degree flexion position, all right, let's look at the neck. Now that's because we have this flexion contracture. So look at the neck. The neck now looks horizontal, which is what you have with coxavera. So as you'll become aware, the coxavera that we're really seeing is positional in its um, it's uh, projectional. So the projection of the neck is horizontal. It's no longer a inclined femoral neck. 
it is a horizontal neck, like a 90 degree neck shaft angle. Okay. The next thing, so after we flex the upper femur 90 degrees, we can then abduct the femur from that position. So we abduct it. And when we abduct the femur, notice that the neck now has that declined inclination. So it's, it, it look, the projection of the neck goes from proximal to distal, like the most severe coxavera. So what we're calling severe coxavera is really the declination of the neck due to a combination of flexion and abduction, okay? And so this is the position of the upper femur in these severe CFD deformities. Now, what about the distal femur? So distal femur, we can, it's short, and we can glue it on to the neck by externally rotating it and um, attaching it to the proximal femur, which is in the deformed position. So this is the final deformity, final CFD. You've got the external rotation or retroversion. You've got the flexion, okay? And you've got that abduction of the proximal part. And you've got this apparent coxavera. Now, doesn't this look like our original x-ray? So we've got this severe appearing coxavera. This here, we, in, we assume is the greater trochanter, but as I've shown you, the greater trochanter is actually way over here. It's right here in the back. So this is what we call the bump. Okay, let's look at it from the side. So when we look at it from the side, we can flex the upper femur. Now, I want you to notice something. When we flex the femur in the sagittal plane, what happens to the neck? Because this is a 130 degree neck shaft angle, the neck looks retroverted. So this position converts the normal neck shaft angle into the appearance of a retroverted femoral neck. So since the neck is normally 130 degrees, this becomes a 50 degree retroversion, okay? Relative to the horizontal, it's 50 degrees retroverted, which is a lot of retroversion. Now let's look at this. So now we abduct that fragment. <clears throat> when we abduct the fragment, it maintains that retroverted appearance, points the, you know, uh, it, it, it moves the trochanter more proximal, which therefore shortens the distance of the abductor muscles so they contract. So in this position, we have a very shortened abductor mechanism. We also have a very shortened um, piriformis muscle going to the greater trochanter because of that distance. It goes to the piriformis fossa. So, so and, and then you can see our tensor fasciolata, that's gonna be shortened as it both strings across. Our rectus femoris is gonna be shortened. So we are, I mean, I don't, it's a chicken and egg thing, which came first, the contracture or the bony deformity? We don't know, it happens in utero, but they go hand in hand. And certainly the bony position promotes the contracture because the femoral head and neck never leave this position, even though they move. And then we add the distal femur. And by adding the distal femur, we also externally rotate it relative to the neutral pelvis. So by the way, everything is relative to a horizontal pelvis lying on its sacrum like that in the normal AP position. <clears throat> so we externally rotate it. So now you have a external rotation combined with an apparent retroversion, apparent. So this is a real retroversion with apparent retroversion, with apparent var varus, okay? And notice this thing. 
this looks like the proximal femur is extended and yet we have a flexion deformity. Now you might say this is what this apparent extension is what compensates for the flexed proximal femur. Otherwise, the leg would be pointing straight up. Okay, so if we didn't have this apparent extension, then the leg would be pointing straight up. And the retroversion helps with that apparent extension. Okay, so it's a very complicated geometric thing. It, you know, it's interesting. So this model, which I, I'm hoping is helpful to you, this took me a year to figure out how to explain this. And <clears throat> uh, it has a little story to it because the artist who did all these wonderful drawings, her name is Pamela Ross. She still works with me. Um, I was trying to get her to illustrate this, but to do that, I had to convey to her a mental picture of these deformities. And I was showing her the 3D CT, I was showing her the x-rays and she just couldn't see it. And I and really, I was getting very frustrated with her. In fact, I almost fired her because it was, I, I fired, almost fired her because of my own frustration, not really hers. She was just reacting to the fact that I wasn't communicating well enough. Um, it forced me to recognize that I'd spent almost a year working with her with nothing to show for it. That all the drawings were wrong. I wasn't communicating well. And so I broke it down into the movements that you see here. And from that moment on, even I began to understand it better. So now I can communicate and explain it. And in fact, you suddenly look at it and say, well, that's pretty obvious. It's not that complicated. <laughs> I, you know, it always is after the fact. I mean, you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, when you really break it down now, is pretty obvious and not that complicated. But it's, it's getting to the point where you can visualize this and come up with the idea that was the challenging part. And um, so I, I conceived of this, I understood this deformity in 1997. So that was my eureka moment when I finally understood this. I couldn't communicate it properly, probably, till about 2011. And that's when these drawings were created. So, okay. So in 1997, I created this super hip procedure. Um, people often ask me, where do you get the name super? Why is it because it's such a super big operation or you need to be Superman to do it or you know, it's an arrogant statement of some sort, uh, none of the above. It came from, um, we were doing these procedures rather commonly and we have to, for billing purposes, we have to code every procedure. And as you know, this procedure has a lot of steps, there's like 50 steps and has about 30 or 40 codes that you have to put down in order to get paid for it. And um, secretary told me, you don't need to keep writing out all these codes. If you give this procedure a name, I'll add it to our super bill. We had this super bill, which included all the procedures that we did at our clinic. And, and that'll be it. And the moment she said super bill, I thought, oh, great. Just call this the super hip procedure. And it was intended as a billing code, not as the name of the operation. But my secretary started booking the procedure on the operative schedule as the super hip procedure. So she really named it and it stuck. And then subsequently my fellows said, if that's the super hip procedure, then the procedure that I developed even before this for the knee is the super knee. And then ultimately one of my fellows named the ankle procedure for the fibular hemilius, the super ankle. So we were kind of stuck with this name. <laughs> it was just meant as a billing code. Uh, I'd never really bothered to give it a name. Uh, most of you who know me, I just move on to the next thing. I don't have time to spend on stuff like that. 
Um, so I know these things are important to a lot of people. So this kind of stuck. So we had to come up with a acronym for super. And so the acronym for super, so that it wouldn't look like some arrogant thing that, you know, it's, it's such a super big procedure, only Dror Paley can do it. That, that was not the intention. Okay, never has, never was, was never, <laughs> you know, I get criticized for the name super hip all the time. Um, now I kind of laugh at it. But anyway, it's, so we gave it an acronym, Systematic Utilitarian Procedure for Extremity Reconstruction, which could mean anything. Anyway, sounds good. Systematic Utilitarian Procedure for Extremity Reconstruction. And that's what super stands for now. But that was actually, we came up with that a couple of years later, not at the time. So this, I, I wrote up the explanation of this in one of my book chapters, and some people have found that quite amusing. So let's come back to this. So the first super hip was done in 1997 for a subtrope type. And uh, in fact, it was one of Dr. Hertzenberg's patients. Um, I, he showed me one of his cases and I said, ah, you know, that case would be best done with this new operation I visualized in my head. <laughs> and, you know, I can't believe he let me operate on his patient. Of course, it's safer to operate on someone else's patient the first time. Um, so we did it and it was a great success. Um, and uh, so, like I said, there is some history to this whole thing, which is rather amusing. Uh, the case you just saw, you can see... Um, after the super hip procedure. And I, I actually demonstrated this case in Aschau, Germany. So this Italian child came across the border and we did his surgery there. And, and actually he's never had a lengthening, but he's ended up with a really fantastic hip. And I saw him not long ago and um, you know, now he's an adult. And you know, I asked him, what's the difference? He still uses a prosthesis. And his answer was that now he can walk as long as he wants, as far as he wants. Like before, he couldn't walk with his friends into the village to go to the pub or to any event or anything. It was just too far, he needed to drive. Now he could walk with his friends, he didn't get tired. Uh, you know, it made a huge difference. So, you know, there's all kinds of controversy about lengthening for CFD, you know, how much, you know, versus amputation and so on. My argument is all these people who do amputation even if that's what they want to do, like a Symes amputation, still got to fix the hip. So the super hip procedure um, is a standalone procedure. It doesn't mean you have to lengthen, but you do need to normalize the hip. I mean, to leave the hip the way it was is, is you know, like this, leads to arthritis, leads to all kinds of problems. And, and so you're much better off to fix this, end up like this, mobile hip, mobile knee, and then, you know, uh, what, what else you do, whether you lengthen or whether you just wear a prosthesis or whether you do a Symes amputation, um, you know, that, that's a whole different matter. Okay, so let's, let's go through this procedure. And this is a, <clears throat> I will start by saying that, look, this is, this is a procedure for people who are very familiar with the anatomy around the pelvis, hip, and femur, and knee. And if you're not that familiar, get familiar before you do one of these. This is not for inexperienced surgeons. I, I hope I don't create a rash of disasters by, you know, people going out and saying, I want to try that. And it has happened. Okay. Um, I'll never forget a story with Professor Elizarov. I was at a meeting in Houston and uh, someone who was just starting with his method uh, took on a very complicated olease disease and he put on a frame for the femur and tibia and so on, multi-level correction. It was a disaster. It was terrible. It was so many complications. And he was so proud of it though. And he turned to the professor and he said, what do you think of uh, you know, my case? And the professor said, 
that is my apparatus, but that's not my method. <laughs> and, you know, I always remember that because I, I see, I see people doing the super hit and I, I want to say that's not my method. What you did is not the super hip. It's not, you know, and, and the problem is they label it. And if it fails, by the way, it's not they failed. It's the super hip failed. I always find that, you know, I think that's a quality of human nature is we, we're not good at taking uh, blame for ourselves, certainly not in front of our patients. Okay, so please, um, you know, understanding this is one thing, doing it is another. And I don't think this should be done by every person. I think it should be done by regional centers that get a lot of experience in this. And, and I think it's important for every orthopedic surgeon to know so they can refer such a case to local experts. All right. So the first thing was we created a model as we've discussed of this. And when we start this operation, the patient is, is supine, but on a bump this is very important. The patient is rolled about 45 degrees. Okay. This position is very important. The bump's not under the back. The bump is under the ischium. And it's very important that the bump be right there under the ischium, as you can see, and that it really rolls the patient. Okay. You need to be able to pull the bump out. And in order to pull the bump out, we actually put tape around the bump and make it into a string and pass it all the way up to anesthesia. And then when I say to them later, pull out the bump, they can just pull the string and boom, it comes out. Okay. No one needs to go under the table. Now, the incision is from the top of the iliac crest, so up here, to the tibial tuberosity. Now, if you're not going to do the super knee, instead of going all the way down, just stop at the joint line. Now, you, you might say, that's a really long incision. Well, my answer to that is, that's a really short femur. Okay? So this is not on that femur, this on a short femur. I guess if you had a really long, relatively long CFD with this deformity, you can do this as two sections and tunnel in between and leave a skin bridge. And in fact, we do do that on the odd case, especially the older children who present because they, they have such a long thigh relatively and you don't need that whole length. You'll, you'll understand why you need all of this length by the time I finish the, uh, the uh, description. You then elevate the anterior flap. Now, I'm gonna tell you right now, this is, seems like the easiest part of the procedure. This is one of the toughest part of the procedures to do well, and especially with a cautery. So this is gonna bleed a lot. So I, I do this with a cautery, and I elevate the whole thing, moving the cautery very quickly. The problem is, if you go to do it with a cautery, you will create, um, you know, multiple, multiple rents in the fascia, rendering the fascia useless for the super knee. So we're going to harvest this fascia, but it means that it can't have big holes in it. So the cautery is harder to control than a scissors. And with the scissors, you can peel this off, but you get a lot of bleeding and it takes longer. So I take this whole flap down very quickly, the full thickness, no fat left behind, but I, I put it at an angle that I can really elevate the, the big flap. Um, I like to find the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. It's not critical, but I do like to find it and decompress it, but it does represent one end of where I cut the fascia. The other end is where the um, the patella is and where the patella is, uh, we, uh, make a little rent in the fascia lata or the iliotibial band, uh, next to it. And then we connect these two either with the scissors or a fasciotome. Okay. So that that's the anterior cut of the fascia. Now, posteriorly, we put our fingers inside the fascia up to the intramuscular septum, 
and we make a little cut down here behind the septum. So actually behind the septum and we go up and we go proximally. And then at the very proximal end, you separate the fascia from the gluteus maximus muscle. So you start separating the, the muscular attachment of the gluteus maximus to the fascia lata. And then you peel it off, cutting it across at the muscle tendon junction anteriorly with the tensor fascia lata, going a little further with the gluteus max. So then you have this long piece of fascia going all the way to Gertie's tubercle. Now, if we do a super knee, we're gonna split that in two, use the anterior half going medially, the posterior half going laterally for the, for the reverse Macintosh and Macintosh procedures. And then we're going to um, you know, create ligaments. If you don't need to do a super knee, at the end of the procedure, I just remove this, okay? So the, the fascia, removing the fascia is important both for exposure, but also if you're gonna do subsequent lengthening, your fascia will tether your lengthening. So think of it as the enemy of lengthening, so you take it out. Next thing is to um, identify, you go anteriorly, identify the rectus femoris tendon. And a lot of times you see the first thing you see is the ascending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex. So you cauterize that or clip it. And then you can cut the rectus femoris. Okay, and you cut, I like to cut it completely, uh, frequently at the conjoint level so that its indirect head is disconnected too. Now, immediately next to that, okay, you're going under sartorius. There's sartorius. I'm going to go back and show you. So you're lifting sartorius and you find the rectus at the anterior, inferior iliac spine. Immediately medial to that is the femoral nerve. And the femoral nerve coming under the inguinal ligament, and it's on the surface of the um, psoas. So this little um, cross section on the right shows you the femoral nerve, anteromedial on the iliopsoas, and the psoas tendon, posterior medial. So the medial side of the psoas does not have, not a tendon, not a nerve, but the, the, the I'm sorry, the medial, the lateral side of the psoas. The medial side has both, one in the front, one in the back. And they're very similar sizes to each other. Now, you don't want to mistake one for the other, obviously. In a very deformed case, I will tell you that before I cut the rectus, I find the nerve because the nerve can be running right beside the rectus under here. So when you go to cut it, you could be coming very close to the nerve. So I sometimes now first find the nerve and then cut the rectus. Now you then elevate, so remember this is on the anterior surface of the iliopsoas. Now you lift up the iliopsoas adjacent to the inferior spine and you look underneath and you'll find the psoas tendon and you cut the psoas tendon leaving the iliacus muscle intact. So you release the psoas tendon and that allows you to um, uh, free it up. And you're, you know, you're gradually releasing structures that are flexors. Your first one was the tensor fascia lata. Second one was the rectus femoris. And the third one is the psoas tendon. So once you've done that, you're done in the front. You've released all of the anterior flexors that you want to release. The next step to go posteriorly. Now to go posteriorly, the way you get there is by retracting the gluteus maximus muscle. Now remember, you found the gluteus maximus way back here, okay? 
So when you took off this fascia, you took it off the maximus. So you already see the edge of the maximus. So when you come to the back, you retract the maximus, you open up the bursa, and you can find your sciatic nerve if you want, okay, and decompress it. And you look for the border of the piriformis muscle, the inferior border. Now, we're going to be cutting the piriformis tendon. Now, notice on this picture, there's an artery and vein there. So, in fact, you can usually see it here. That is the terminal branch of the uh, inferior gluteal vessels, inferior gluteal artery and vein. Um, so the inferior gluteal vessels run uh, posterior to the um, piriformis and they um, anastomose with the medial femoral circumflex, which gives circulation to the femoral head. So it's kind of a supplementary redundant circulation to the femoral head. And for that reason, please be careful and do not cauterize this, do not release this, be aware of its existence and when you cut, it actually helps you identify the inferior border of the piriformis. Sometimes it's hard to separate the piriformis from the gluteus medius. So that's the border of gluteus medius. Now, what's hard to see here, gluteus medius is actually more lateral. It's actually overlaps the superior edge of piriformis. <clears throat> so. Gluteus medius, you can separate from here, but it is it has a very sharp posterior border. It goes to the greater trochanter, and it is completely separate from the piriformis. And you can find that difference. It's a little bit complicated the first few times. So you release the piriformis. It doesn't matter if you cut it at the muscle or the tendon, you're trying to completely separate it. Okay, obviously be careful of the sciatic nerve. Once you've done that, you then, um, the last muscle that is tight is the abductor. So now you split the apophysis and you split it by splitting the inferior spine, superior spine, and then the crest of the ilium. And you split it just like you would do for a Salter osteotomy, cutting with a knife all the way across here. So, Inferior spine is easy to split. The rectus femoris tendon is on the lateral side. The um, superior spine is easy to split. They're both wide. The, the interval between them, the interspinous crest, is very narrow. And so try and cut through that. Uh, it sometimes has some vessels. It actually has this continuation of the lateral femoral circumflex ascending branch. Okay, when you slide this off, that's called an abductor slide. And on the inside, when you slide off the medial side, that's called an iliacus slide. So you are in, in all of those, by the way, I mean, I don't know how it's done in India, but um, we have to code for all our procedures and we also get paid for them. Um, so that each of those is a code. So that's lengthening of iliacus, lengthening of abductors. So we are slide, it's called an abductor muscle slide, iliacus muscle slide. And the iliacus muscle slide, of course, is contributing to the, uh, it's the last flexor you're releasing. Now the abductor, I said it's the last flexor, it's not completely true because the front half of the abductor reaches in front of the hip and therefore acts as a flexor, especially with this deformity. So when you take down the iliacus, I mean, the, sorry, the, uh, the hip abductors, you are also doing partially a um, flexor release. So you're releasing, it's the last flexor truly is the hip abductor. So when you take that down, you have done everything you can do extra articular to free the hip 
uh, uh, a hip flexor contracture. Okay, and it's mostly a extra articular hip flexion contracture. You've also now treated the hip abduction contracture, which tethers the greater trochanter. So you've untethered the greater trochanter by releasing the piriformis and by sliding the abductors and by lengthening the tensor fascia lata. So again, I want you to picture these, the soft tissue part, which is just as important as all the bony work. Notice how much soft tissue work there is before you can do anything with the bone. The next step is to um, cut the periosteum on the femur and elevate the quadriceps. Now this last step is the last muscle to move, but this is not because it's contracted. This is for exposure. So you're exposing the femur putting home and elevators under the periosteum and that becomes your abductor release. I mean, your, sorry, quadriceps elevation, not release. Um, once you've exposed the femur and where do you stop? You stop at the bony cartilaginous juncture of the greater trochanter. Okay, so um, give me one second. I'm gonna turn down the air conditioning in my room. I'm freezing here, one second. Okay, I'm back. Um, so the next step is, is the beginning of all the bony work. And the bony work involves starting with injecting the femoral head capsule to see to visualize femoral head so you're doing an arthrogram of the hip and here you can see i actually start with injecting saline to confirm that i'm in the joint because i don't want to inject the dye in the wrong place because it'll obscure what i'm doing so i inject saline and with my spine i use a 20 gauge, the yellow one, 20 gauge spinal needle. And if the fluid comes back, I know I'm in the joint. Um, and then I inject the dye. And you can see the dye going around the femoral head and the edge of the capsule. Okay. You can almost picture the greater trochanter there. Um, once the die is in, you can reposition the proximal femur. You're untethered now. You don't have flexion, you don't have external rotation, and you don't have um, the uh, abductor contracture. So because you're untethered, you can place the proximal femur in its anatomically normal position. So you can you know, cross the leg and extend it. So you're extending it, you're rotating it uh, internally, um, you're uh, um, adducting it. And so you're undoing the deformity with the femur intact. And that's what it looks like. And that's what the radiograph looks like, okay? And once it's in this position, you place your first guide wire. Your first guide wire it's placed by palpation. You palpate the tip of the greater trochanter and you go into the center of the femoral head. And um, so that becomes the first guide wire. Then you place second guide wire. Second guide wire um, is based on the first guide wire. So in fact, the purpose of the first guide wire is to accurately place the second one. And so the second guide wire is 45 degrees to the first. And some of you might say, well, why don't you just place one guide wire up the femoral neck? I think that's what you're trying to do. And I wish it was that easy. The problem is the very small femoral neck, it's nicely seen in this illustration, but in fact, radiographically, you don't, really appreciate the full thing. All you see is, is kind of an arthrogram like that. So you're trying to put a guide wire up a ghost 
I mean, it's an invisible femoral neck. And so you place your second one 45 degrees to the first. I'll explain in a minute why 45 degrees. And this is the reason. So when we're finished, when this operation is done, you want the shaft of the femur to lie where this red line is. Now, what, what's the relationship of this red line? This red line um, is at an 85 degree angle to the first guide wire. So just remember the normal uh, joint orientation angle, the MPFA should be about 85 degrees. This red line is 130 degrees to the neck. In other words, a neck shaft angle of 130, which would be normal. So that would be your angle there, 85, 130. So to create that, if you look at this triangle created by the two guide wires, okay, where this is 130 and that's 85, then this angle, if this is 130 here, this must be 50 here, right? 180 degrees. And then rule of you know, Euclidean geometry, this adds up to 180, 85 plus 50. So therefore this must be 45. So this is a very basic thing, okay? You know, the, 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 this is, a, I use this for every hip osteotomy, by the way. The only time this is off is if the greater trochanter is overgrown. So if it's overgrown, <clears throat> of course, the, it throws everything off. But assuming that you don't have an overgrown greater troch, this is the normal relations. So you don't have to think of all this. All you have to do, use a goniometer, first guide wire, second guide wire, 45 degrees. So I place the second one 45 degrees, and I don't worry about being in the center. And then I go to the lateral and I place a new second guide wire based on the first one. So the first one showed me where the 45 degrees is, but this kind of the second second guide wire is based on getting it exactly in the center of the head. Now the center, this view is one of the most confusing views. It is a cross table lateral view with the image intensifier. And what you should see, okay, you can see it here on the, so there's the guide wire, but you can see here the dark shadow in the middle, okay, um, is the ossific nucleus. So that's the ossific nucleus there. And then around that is the femoral neck. And so you can see here this clear zone, that's the femoral neck on the arthrogram. And lastly, you'll see the femoral head outline, which is there. And if you look carefully, it's actually a fourth ring and it's the acetabular outline, which you can actually see here as well, is there. So there are actually four rings, but 